For this next panel, though, uh, the topic is going to be talent pivoting in a time of crisis. Well, we're going to change gears a bit. And for those of you who don't know me, a personal passion of mine is actually talent management. I just love being able to work with and to foster our next generation of leaders. However, as we know it, 2020 has seen the highest unemployment rates in our history. Uh, it is absolutely brutal, brutal out there. Uh, I myself was laid off earlier this year, and I know firsthand exactly how difficult that can be. Um, and I was one of the lucky ones because I was able to find opportunities. Uh, as a result, you know, we, we felt that it was going to be really, really important for us to talk about talent tonight. Uh, and I'm very excited to be able to moderate this panel for you. We have three amazing individuals here tonight. So starting off, we're going to start off with Sam Bellamy, founder and president of Bazooka Inc., a Montreal-based tech company that creates HR, AI-powered tools to help organizations become more productive and inclusive. Other than being an entrepreneur, Sam is an educator, she's a speaker, a PhD candidate, and an inclusion and diversity advocate in data science. Sam, what have you been experiencing so far in your line of work in the wake of COVID? Hi, everyone. Um, what I've been experiencing uh, post-COVID uh, in terms of recruitment is uh, the different um, values that have been brought up to, uh, to light from different candidates. For example, um, they've been asking uh, to work and find jobs that are more, um, uh, more focused on working remotely. So for those who employers decided to go back to the main office, um, a lot of them call me and say, Sam, I want to find a job who uh, will continue working remotely because I really enjoy working from home, as well as they want a business where they can work for who is more flexible, uh, so they can spend more time with their kids, and as well, they're not, um, they're not open to work as many hours as before COVID, because they're realizing that it's not always about work, but um, taking time for themselves and their families is, has become a, a, a higher priority. Interesting. This idea of work-life balance. Uh, I could have sworn I've seen an article in the last couple of years, which are like the millennial problem. They want work-life balance. Who knew that this was something that absolutely everyone in the world wanted? Exactly. On our panel as well, uh, we, we also have Julia Lataka, founder of Analyze HR Group. Uh, Julia is an HR and HR analytics professional who is passionate about improving workplace practices that support both employees and business objectives, specifically through leveraging research, data, and technology. She is the co-founder of Analyze HR, an organization that offers events, training, and consulting services in the HR and HR analytics space. She also currently works with WorkTango, an employee survey software that helps their clients build out employee voice strategies that utilize employee feedback data. Outside of work, she is passionate about community building and social impact work, traveling, career coaching, and health and wellness. Julia, what have you been experiencing right now in the wake of COVID-19? Hi everyone, um, thanks, for, thanks for the question. Thanks for having me on tonight. Um, my role has definitely shifted through COVID and so I really take on a holistic HR lens just because my role has um, been very much HR um, and talent management. And now as I moved over to WorkTango, really working with a lot of HR and business leaders as they tackle their employee voice strategies. So I would say that HR has been in a, quite a unique role where it plays this the middle between um, both employees and leadership. And it's really helping steer the ship in terms of, of directions to take and decisions to make amidst everything going on during COVID. So I would say um, in, the, in the field of HR right now, and throughout COVID, it's been very reactionary, and HR has really had to pivot um, as, as COVID has developed, as regulations have, have changed. We've really relied on you know, government to, to tell us kind of what we're doing, and we've had to react. So I don't think a lot of HR leaders out there have been getting lots of sleep. And we've really had to, to shift to this remote work and working with, um, working with the challenges that come with that. So whether it's you know, parents who have kids at home and, and they need a more flexible schedule, whether it's keeping employees engaged during this time when everyone's working remotely um, and now also thinking about return to work and what that looks like and what people are comfortable with and um, 
you know, what kind of equipment they need. Um, I really do think that out of all of this, employee voice has, has gotten stronger because that's what really a lot of HR leaders are relying on is, is what their employees need and, and what they're comfortable with as, as we move forward to, you know, remote work. So I would say that there's been a lot of pivoting and a lot of um, shifts and, and um, a lot of reaction that, that has been within the, within the HR space. I love, I love the idea of having a stronger employee voice. That is so powerful in today's day and age. It really goes hand in hand with sort of some of the demands or what people are looking for in the workplace. For sure. Uh, last but not least, we have Mitch Gudgeon, co-founder and CEO of TalentFit AI. Mitch leads the TalentFit AI and was the catalyst in bringing together TalentFit AI's founding team. After witnessing the power of strong culture, team culture through sport and as an entrepreneur, Mitch knew there had to be a better, more data-driven approach to assessing fit that could improve job satisfaction, engagement, retention, and team effectiveness. From this vision, TalentFit AI was born. Mitch has been a serial entrepreneur since high school, founding three different companies while playing basketball at the University of Victoria and rugby for Team Canada. Mitch also holds an MBA from Queen's, uh, Sm Queen Smith School of Business. Mitch, what are you seeing in, your, in the wake of COVID-19? Thanks for, thanks for having me here, Sarah. And uh, I'll probably echo a lot of what Julia and Sam both said because they've, they've hit the nail on the head with, uh, with their comments. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously through, through this time, a lot of companies were hit very hard um, for COVID and, um, you know, mostly industry, industry wise that way, but there are actually some companies that have actually been flourishing during this time. You think of things like ed tech and, and delivery services, supply chain, et cetera. Um, a lot of them have actually been scaling up, um, even though a lot of other companies are, are downsizing. Um, some of the stuff I'm hearing, at least uh, from industry is that, um, and, I, and I believe Julia said this already, is there's a, there's a big, um, you know, focus on wellness and, you know, things like mental health and, and employee well-being. Um, you know, trying to figure out how do you engage employees remotely? Um, how do you even build and maintain culture in a remote environment? Um, you know, I think every company believes their culture is unique. And that's, you know, that's the bread and butter of what we do. Um, and it's, it's now they're trying to do this all remote. And so I think that's a whole new way of operating for most companies. Um, and I, I believe also the people function has even become uh, you know, more important aspect of the business and, and maybe even more priority than it ever has before uh, and under the spotlight more than it ever has before uh, because of this. Um, you know, I think the other part that's really uh, on a lot of people's minds right now too is, um, you know, is there going to be a second wave of this right now? Um, because, you know, and, and what will the effect be on businesses that are out there, right? So, you know, I think some companies, um, speaking to a couple of our clients, is that, you know, they do want to scale, but they're also hesitant to scale now um, if they believe, you know, what we've been hearing is there going to be a second wave in, you know, October, the, the fall, the winter time frame. Um, so I think they've started to figure out, like, how do we make a lot smarter hiring decisions? And sometimes even less is more. Uh, and the example of, you know, one of the companies we were talking to, you know, hiring 20 salespeople because they got new funding. And then they've had to lay most of them off now because of this. Um, and so, you know, maybe it would be better just to hire one or two people and then slowly scale up with as the, as the need and demand comes. Um, so I think that's something to really think about uh, during this time. It's interesting. I think as I hear about tech companies growing, they grow in like these explosive spurts. Um, and, you know, there, it's not a bad idea to maybe take a more, uh, a more thoughtful approach to that, especially given today's environment. Super interesting. Uh, Julia, I'm just, I'm wondering, like, from your perspective, do you, what do you see the long-term impact of COVID-19 is going to be on recruitment and talent management? Sure. So I'll speak to, um, I guess, broad talent management and recruitment. I think one of the major long-term impacts is this idea of remote work and being a bit more flexible. I think employers, they've had to be flexible in that employees have been working remotely. And I don't think we're going to be able to go back to requiring everyone to be back into the office. So I do think that moving forward, a lot of employees, and as Sam mentioned, are going to be asking to be working remotely. And employers are, you know, maybe going to have to take on these mixed models of both having offices and, and having remote remote employees, which I think poses a challenge for HR leaders as they think about a lot of their practices and policies. Um, for example, how do you pay someone who is in Toronto and in an office versus someone who's remotely and working in a more rural area? So um, that's just one example. Another example is performance reviews. There's actually data to show that, um, you know, people who actually who work in office are more likely to get promoted versus remote employees. So again, thinking about 
you know, a lot of the processes that are under the HR umbrella and, and how do we manage those mixed models moving forward. Um, I think also we're, we are going to, you know, continue that adoption of, of you know, digital with, especially within the recruitment space, uh, digital, uh, digital interviews and, and really making that more of a, a norm for, for recruitment and, and other areas within HR. So um, yeah, those were kind of the three main long-term impacts that I saw. From this perspective of having employees like l l really live anywhere that they want and be able to work remotely, I'm, anecdotally, I'm starting to hear companies talk about the challenges of this from like a benefits perspective or just like now do they run into like provincial laws because like we say we operate in Toronto, but I've got people in every province across Canada now. And it's interesting that this is actually such a complex issue that a lot of people are not necessarily acknowledging or talking about um, very openly right now. So it'll be interesting to see what the guidance is coming you know as different companies kind of experiment with this model right now yeah and uh, I, will just, I will just add to that quickly i think there's still a lot of gray area especially when it comes even for for uh, legislation like things like health and safety there are questions about you know health and safety policies if you're remote and i just don't think that we've ever really had to face that so mm. you know a lot of it's still being like is that now a workplace safety problem like is this how does how does that how does that work uh very interesting um so mitch my next question is actually for you so like how do you think do you think we're going to go back to normal like what do you what do you think the new normal is going to be this everything from working to home to like this contactless economy or privacy concerns is you know, I'm starting to hear leaders are, you know, some of them are worried about if their workers are being effective working remotely. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, this is a, this is a big topic and a big question. I think there's lots of um, sort of even further downstream effects than even we're thinking right now. Um, so I, so I, I, so I'll start with, I do think some things are going to go back to normal. Um, I do think though this shift to remote work, as we've been talking about, this is going to change uh, life forever from now on. Um, you know, I think uh, this probably sped up what maybe would have took 10 years to do uh, previously, and every company has been forced into it. Um, and so I would also say, though, right now that there, so I, I was listening to a podcast actually a little while ago, and somebody said, this isn't actually remote work, what we're doing right now. This is actually, you're being forced to work remotely during a pandemic. And so I think there's a lot of things that are different about the situation we have now um, than there will be maybe a year, two years out from now. But I still think this, this notion to move towards remote work is gonna be something that's gonna be here to stay. So, you know, I think some of the pieces you need to think about now though is, is you know, as companies realize that they can be just as productive working remotely or almost as productive working remotely or even more productive possibly working remotely. And our company ourselves, we've been fully remote from the start. So this is, you know, we, we've been in this space for a long time. Um, but companies are realizing, you know, we can re reduce our real estate footprint um, you know, companies are shifting to e-commerce, um, you know, the, you know, less people in the office are needing to be in the office on a daily basis uh, or using hoteling. Um, and, you know, even on the last panel, they're talking about businesses around these offices even being hit hard. So the, you know, the, the food vendors and the grocery stores and, and the convenience stores and whatnot, um, you know, these are being hit hard too. So, um, and, and, you know, listening to one of the, um, CEOs of a major financial company in downtown Toronto, uh, he was talking about how he was talking to a CFO and said, you know, why do we need all this space? Why don't we just reduce the amount of space that we have uh, in downtown Toronto and let people work out of, out of the city? Um, and so, so I think there's like lots of effects. So you think of that when, when all of a sudden, um, you know, companies are, are moving to remote, um, there's less interactions in the office than normally would. So this could cause things like social isolation possibly. Um, there's also impacts on employee mental health and wellness. Um, tied to what Julia was saying is I think there's gonna have to be new systems in place, new ways of doing work, um, to make sure that these things are taken into account. Um, you know, the other th thing you mentioned before was, um, do people even need to be, so they obviously don't need to be in downtown Toronto anymore for, you know, doing a podcast, we're talking about this panel here, um, but, you know, do they need to be in Ontario? Do they need to be in Canada? Do they not need to be in Canada? And also, what do companies do? Do they look at maybe even outsourcing some work to other parts of the world where the skill gap isn't, isn't great anymore, but the labor costs are extremely lower? 
Um, and some companies are already making this shift right now. And I've, I've heard that from a couple of different organizations that, um, you know, they've been shifting some of their engineering roles or even data science roles to um, other places in the world. And obviously that becomes this whole people management side of things too. So once again, HR being brought to the forefront as meaning a, a, probably playing a bigger and very different role in the organization. Um, there's a comment you made at Sarah about trust uh, and how do you even monitor these, monitor these employees, right? So do, do companies trust their employees inherently or are they gonna put tracking systems where they're watching their every move expecting them to be in front of the computer eight hours a day? Um, so I think companies are gonna have to decide which one they're gonna be and, uh, and sort of take that path and how they wanna manage the people. The other one too that I was gonna mention, and this kind of goes more to the downstream effects of all this though, is that you know, as we look at things like people not being in the office anymore, um, you know, it's, you know, these, these tenants are going to no longer be paying, you know, their landlords and these landlords a lot of time are, you know, they either are real estate investment trusts or, um, you know, owned by real estate investment trusts and our pension funds are the ones that are investing in all of these real investments and real estate investment trusts. So, you know, what does this now mean for the, the future economy in Canada, um, when pensions are not getting, you know, almost what was the, the guaranteed return that they would, um, uh, by investing in real estate. Um, if they no longer need this in downtown Toronto. So I think there's some things that we need to really think. And I think this remote work isn't just all of a sudden it's remote work. It is what is the impact we have to think in the long term and how this is going to affect the Canadian economy on a, on a bigger scale. Um, and I'll just make one more point, though, on, on sort of going back to this new normal or not. Uh, and I don't mean to take up too much time here. But I believe this, this also is a big wake up call for us um, on, on sort of the global scale that um, you know, the world is very connected. And I think this is a huge opportunity now for things around like even, you know, what we call social innovation, whether it's sustainable energy, food security, uh, you know, reducing carbon footprint, access to education, waste management, you know, health and safety. Um, I think these things are now more global issues than ever before. And we see this, um, you know, this pandemic affecting us like this. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be new ways to innovate uh, in the future, and they're going to have a, possibly a global impact too. Mm, it's true. Uh, when it comes to disruption, I mean, it's, it, it's a fantastic way for us to, to innovate in a lot of these spaces. You said so many interesting things. And it's funny, because I like one of the first things that popped to mind is I know through my group of friends, we've been circulating this like, welcome work remotely from Barbados. We love Canadians. I don't know how many of you uh, people have seen that. And I'm like, God, oh, why not? This sounds amazing, right? They're, they're, they have a special visa essentially for you can go and work in Barbados for a year. They're trying, that's how they're trying to revitalize their economy. Um, and it's also interesting about this idea of shifting roles to where talent is cheaper. And um, I think, I think so, a lot of people can think of uh, like offshoring a lot of roles to say like India or China, or I've, I've heard of Venezuela, you know, where roles are cheaper. But interestingly enough, at least compared to the US, when it comes to tech talent and the dollar uh, value, Canada. This GTA, the Kitchener, Waterloo, the Tri City area, we have incredible tech talent here. And that's why we have, you see Google and Uber and Amazon. That's why you see them opening up offices in, these, in Canada because we have great amount of talent and it's cheap in comparison to what you would get in some parts of the world. So, you know, very interesting. Uh, Sam, I, you know what, it wouldn't, this wouldn't be an event talking about COVID and 2020 if we didn't talk about the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, ever since this, it is absolutely incredible and it is so encouraging watching companies and organizations talk about how they're going to tackle this internally and how they're really going to tackle the anti-racism agenda within. Uh, but you know what, I've seen also a lot of churn in companies are there they don't know where to start. They're looking for help. They're looking for, tip, for tips. Uh, do you have anything that you can share on really moving the diversity and inclusion agenda to actually being the top of the agenda? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say the main thing, uh, the most important thing is to start listening actively. That's the first step. And I see a lot of businesses trying to put up some strategies all over the place without even asking the question to the right people. In, in the company and even outside the company in terms of community, people, clients, um, and anybody working towards the, around the company. And I'd say that's a big mistake. So I would say to the business, really um, create discussion sessions in the business and invite all diverse and non-diverse employees and colleagues to participate and really be able to connect and discuss. And also to conduct um, Confidentially, um, confidential surveys as well. So we make sure that we don't miss any part of sharing experiences 
towards um, racism or lack of opportunities towards uh, BIPOC people. Um, so I would say that's the main that's the main thing that I see that it's an issue right now. It's just it's all over the place, and I think um, it comes from a good place. Uh, and businesses want to do something, but first step, listen, listen and organize with the people who are related to that issue specifically. I love that. Just listen actively. That yeah. honestly, that's that's a philosophy that I feel like everyone should have in life. Life period, right? Friends, family, um, strangers. I think that's so. That's it's just so powerful, right? Yeah. But Sam, like, have you along with this, have you observed any effective techniques in being able to actually remove the unconscious bias bias from like talent management, for example? Yeah, um, I would say um, to make sure that uh, the workplace is more inclusive. Uh, first, I see a lot of businesses who hire a uh, diversity and inclusion manager. I think mm. it's a great step, um, and, but it's not over. Um, and if the business doesn't have the fund to hire somebody full time to do that job, uh, there, there are a lot of, um, of freelancers and consultants who are specified in inclusion and diversity. That I would say that. And in terms of inclusion and make sure that um, the process stays inclusive in terms of recruitment, I would say um, that we need um, to be data driven in our decisions. And if you don't have the technology to gather the right data in terms of HR, um, the business should um, get one. I mean, there are different tools that exist uh, that gather diversity and inclusion data inside the business in terms of employees, but in terms of recruitment as well. Uh, I don't see any reason why today a business would know just by receiving a CV is that person is from a diverse ethnicity or not. It's, 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 it, should be, it should be mandatory in terms of knowledge. We should know that because the way we're gonna treat that CV or that person is gonna be different. The problem is not being different, it's just to be treated less equal because you're different, right? But we need to know if you are uh, a woman or if you are uh, a black, a uh, Latino, and so on and so on. So I think that's an important data and it, that's, a, that's a problem I see in businesses. They don't have the data to take that, that driven de decision. Um, other thing that I would say is, um, is to have to conduct um, interviews and these interviews must be uh, panels with diverse people. So just to make sure that uh, it's representative of the business environment and culture, and that we see through uh, the interview process that diverse inclusion is, is tackled from the beginning as well. So I would say that. And um, otherwise, I would say for the test, sometimes a few position you need uh, some um, office, uh, office tech tools, tests, and stuff like that. Maybe to have them blinded, it means that we don't know who we're testing. We know the names, but at the end of the test is, is, uh, is conducted and we have the results. So make sure that we, we have no unconscious bias that could, be, um, that could be in the process at whatsoever. And another thing I would say for all recruiters, um, all recruiters should make sure to ask themselves specific questions before even taking and observing any CV or meeting any people. And that's the questions are, what are, how am I linked or um, how am I related or how am I, how am I connected to that CV or to that candidate? Is that person is uh, the same gender as mine, same ethnicity? Did that person graduate at the same school as mine? Or do we have the same studies? You know, inclusion doesn't mean only gender, ethnicity. It just means um, different and sometimes we tend, all, all the time, I mean, we tend to hire people that look like you, us and that behave like us. That's a normal, that's a normal um, way of being for human. We feel connected and close to people that look like us or have the same experience as us. And that's not a bad thing. It becomes a bad thing when we, uh, we don't make sure that when we choose that person or we hire that person, we make sure that we didn't hire them because um, that person is ex exactly like us. And that's the main issue that I see. So if, as a recruiter, we are conscious, we, we, we take our unconscious bias and we put them, we, we transfer them as conscious and then we, everything is possible. 
Now, uh, this is, well, so, I mean, so far, this is my favorite quote. I'm going to use this at work. The problem is not being different. It's being, it's not being treated equally. And I think that is so true. And I think, I think an important, there's so many things that you said that I think were so important. I think acknowledging the fact that you're different, acknowledging that the candidate may not necessarily reflect who you are, how you relate to that, that is, that is such a powerful technique. Um, I've encountered organizations actually who think that they're being diverse and inclusive uh, for instance, you know, I think from maybe from a BIPOC perspective, they're not doing too badly on that scale. But the interesting thing is they literally only hire the, from the same schools, from the same programs. So they have literally no diversity of thought. And that becomes a problem. And that's something that they acknowledge. But without taking the steps to, to increase and understand that like, hey, we all went to the exact same university and graduated out of one of two programs, like without acknowledging that, that maybe that is the reason why you're struggling to truly have diverse opinions within the organization um, that is just that's such an interesting trap but on paper they're like but look how diverse we are right and it's but it's not that and organizations that I think can truly embrace diversity uh, and this is just so much more than who you know how you look your gender um, or where you, where you grew up it's truly your education your life experiences that whole package that you're able to bring within an organization that is where we're trying to measure diversity exactly so interesting. There's, you know what, we could, we could honestly talk about, I think, just like a DNI agenda within talent management and recruitment um, till the end of time, because there's just so much here to unpack. And I've seen so many organizations really struggle with this on all fronts, you know, internally, um, performance management, promotion promotions to the talent recruitment cycle where I have people sit here and be like, actually, I was talking to somebody last week who was like, I have the, this number of female candidates that I have for this tech position is like less than 2%. It's brutal, right? And considering how many people who are unemployed today, you know, there's a little bit of a, of a, of a, lack of understanding or just like, there's, there's just this, this knowledge that like, I'm not reaching the right people. How do I, how do I make sure my candidate pool is much more diverse, right? How do I ensure that my practices are being, are including people of, of all genders, all races, and how they identify within that pool, right? Uh, Mitch, Julia, I want to invite the two of you to, to jump in if you guys had any thoughts that you wanted to add to this. I see Mitch unmuted, so he, he gets to go first. I'm happy, I'm happy, to, <laughs> happy to jump in here. I, I, I think what Sam said is, is absolutely correct. Um, I think the first part is listening. Um, and I think what happened even, you know, I saw everybody posting the black square on Instagram and it went from, you know, even businesses were doing that. And, you know, it's, it's great to show support, but at the same time, a lot of them started building strategy without listening to anybody. Um, and I think this is the interesting part. And I've been speaking to a lot of DNI experts too, in, in, in Canada and abroad. Um, and, you know, they're even talking about how they're finally admitting systemic racism, even in their own organizations happens. And now it's that, you know, they've been able to listen to people within their own organization, um, you know, BIPOC and, and uh, other groups and understand, you know, what is it that that is affecting them and how is it affecting them and, and trying to figure out how do you create not only a more diverse climate, uh, but a more inclusive climate and one that people actually feel they belong in. I think that's the that's the key part there and, and sort of what you're alluding to, Sarah and, and Sam, before is it's not just about um, diversity of gender or ethnicity. Um, it's, it's also getting into that diversity of thought and, and that is built on people coming from all different backgrounds, all different experiences, um, and being able to bring those together, but then being able to feel like they can truly belong and, and, you know, speak up in a meeting and talk about their point of view without being silenced because, you know, they're a woman or, or BIPOC or whatever it may be. Um, so I think those are, those are important parts. Um, I think data, like Sam mentioned too, is, is so key. Um, you know, getting this data to help, you know, audit your current processes. Um, I think Sarah, on the, on the, when we were talking on the podcast, or maybe on one of the calls we had before this, we talked about um, one of the examples how, um, I, I could get this wrong, but I thought it was Amazon, uh, was actually trying to, um, you know, they, they're saying that their uh, recruitment process was very biased uh, in recruiting more men. And when they, they realized when they were looking at the ads to actually attract men and women of the same, um, you know, age range, the, the, the ads for females were twice or three times more expensive than it was for males of the same group. Uh, demographic and so they are getting you know three times less females applying almost just because of that so looking at every point in your talent process and, and talent program to audit that and then also once again listening to people to understand what you need to do and what to change so that it is a lot more inclusive and, and people do feel truly they belong 
Yeah, I love that example, Mitch. It's probably one of my favorites. And that's actually a really good segue to our next question, which is, Julia, how is data and analytics, how can that help us be affecting us? us? How, how can that help us be more effective in achieving our goals? Yeah, so I think um, data and analytics is really powerful in giving us insights to where there are gaps. You know, without, without that data, you don't really know what's actually going on with within your organization. I think that's why listening is so important and getting employee feedback because as, as a leader, you may think there isn't any, any racism or bias uh, going on within your organization. And, and once you get feedback, and um, I've seen this you know, personally where, where there is actually feedback of people experiencing such things and until, you know, until leaders actually get that data, they won't really know how to take action. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can really keep drilling down into your data. Is it a certain manager? Is it a certain department? And that's where you can really make better, um, you can make better um, decisions moving forward and create action plans that really are strategic and really focused on the problem and where the problem lies. So I think data and analytics is really important. And I think HR actually sits on quite a lot of data. Um, it, and that's what Analyze HR, one of our, one of the key components is that training because there is a large skill gap in in hr leaders sitting on data but not you know a lot of hr people go into hr because they don't like numbers so it's not a skill that they're quite um you know good at or they they want to practice and so i do think hr sits on a lot of data and it's it's really having them better understand it and a lot of the data that we do have is, is quite basic just looking at you know the proportion of men versus women um looking at like promotion data, like start actually just looking and doing basic kind of Excel stuff and you'll be able to see um, some of the, the gaps and, and where you actually have to intervene versus maybe doing an entire organization wide initiative, you can just really focus it on um, a certain department or, or, you know, a certain location. So I think it's really, you know, it's really important in, in driving those decisions that are actually going to have an impact. Um, and Sam did mention this, but I think it's really important to, to have technology that really pulls and tracks data and investing in that, whether it's creating an HR dashboard and, and having, again, having great technologies and tools that combine together and, and spit out kind of a dashboard for you so that you can have real-time feedback on a daily basis and be able to track that over time. And so I think it's important to also have, you know, and employees who understand the importance of data and data integrity, because I do think that uh, what I've seen in, in, in my work is um, data integrity, you know, maybe isn't there. And so, or people don't understand the importance of employee data. So there's a lot of gaps and the data is really unclean and therefore it just, it's not as reliable. So I think um, that portion, that, you know, component of, of data is also really important is to have people who understand the importance of data, the importance of recording it and tracking it properly, and then, um, you know, knowing what to do with it. <laughs> unclean unreliable data is the bane <laughs> of everyone's existence no yeah. <laughs> um there's so many there's so many interesting things that you mentioned there too i think one like one big takeaway is data doesn't have to be scary i i 100 percent the amount of data that hr could is sitting on in any organization especially the ones who think that they don't have data it's immense it's absolutely bonkers what they could do with that right and just like you know maybe being more comfortable with excel to start with and then building up to some of those those more advanced tools or bringing in some of with that data expertise, um, it doesn't have to be as insurmountable or, or that scary to start, right? Uh, I also think just this idea of like true feedback and listening to within the organization, I'm not sure there's, 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 there aren't very many things uh, in the workplace that are as uncomfortable as receiving feedback, um, especially when you suspect that the feedback is not necessarily the best that it is. But I think it's one of the skill sets that we all we all need and we all desperately want and need feedback in order to just become, you know, not only just to grow our careers, just but just to like grow prof uh, per personally as well. Sure. So, uh, Mitch. Talentfit AI, you use an AI and it's very, and you and I have had an interesting conversation that I think that the audience should, should learn more about it. But when it comes to automated screening or AI tools uh, in any business for any, any application, how much control should the computer have versus the human? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, obviously being on an analytics panel here, I'm sure people are uh, all about rah, rah, rah. Uh, analytics and you need it. And obviously, that's the business that we're we're all in here. Um, 
but you know what? I think there's this 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 need for that um, both human and uh, analytics and and you know whether it's automated screening or talent matching or whatever it means. There needs to be this combination of both of them in the process um, for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, I think about it uh, as if you know a, a human is 80% effective in selecting the right candidate, and a and a machine is 80% effective in selecting the right candidate. Put them together, and you're now 96% more effective in selecting the right candidate. Um, and there's that's my, that's about the extent of my uh, mathematical skills there. So uh, getting that getting that equation set up, but um, no, but I think it is one of those things. I think this combination of having uh, human oversight over a lot of the learning um, is important. Um, you know, even even things that are like optimization equations, right? Um, and you're you're using past data to optimize the future, but if new inputs are needed in the future, how are you going to optimize on on those inputs, right? So I think there's there's different ways that and I've, I've heard of companies that are um, even providing things like um, you know maybe some options that they've never looked at before, and it's not based on the options they're provided in the past. But then a, a new option comes in to see, oh, do I like that person, or uh, you know, and maybe I'll look at, take a peek at that person. And does that, is there something about that person that maybe didn't fit the profile that you've been optimizing before to then bring into the equation in the, in the future too? So it can help you sort of shift maybe. Um, but, you know, like you said, the real, the real piece for me is that humans need to be involved in the equation. Um, they need to be, at the end of the day, uh, I think for most decisions, I wouldn't say all decisions, they need to be the final decision maker. Um, but especially around talent, um, I think you do need people in there and, and key so, so selecting the right talent that, uh, that's coming into the organization. I'm such a big fan of this idea of human plus, plus machine. Like just allowing the computer to be really good at what it does, which is analyze tons of data, find interesting patterns and correlations or read thousands of pages a minute, that it just allows us to be more human and apply our own business sense and our own judgment because no one will truly have the instincts the way we do. Um, it's really, really hard to teach that kind of stuff to a computer. And th this is also why even as you're building algorithms, you need people that maybe aren't even data scientists that are involved in the process. Um, because, you know, I, I think all of us are guilty for it when we're working on something, we get too into the weeds and we, we've almost put our blinders on, right? So these other people that bring in, once again, those diverse perspectives, diverse experiences and see things from a different lens, lens that's going to help you create something that's ultimately better than if you just had somebody working on a spreadsheet and, and you know, building an algorithm in isolation. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Well, for our last question of the panel, before we get to the Q&A, um, I want to I wanna sort of end on a message of hope and some advice. So, you know, we talked about how the, the amount of people who are unemployed right now is, is just is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. And it's very difficult being in that in that pool. And so, uh, Sam, do you have any advice that you would give to young professionals right now? I know you do a lot of work with students and interns. Yes, exactly. Um, my main um, advice would be um, focus on their presentation letter on explaining how you'll be able to be autonomous and productive working remotely. Um, and that's a, a, big, a, a big thing for businesses. I have a lot of students and interns and young professionals that got, the, that got their first jobs canceled during the summer and internships canceled because the business do not understand and don't, don't see how they're going to train and manage somebody who has no experience at all remotely. It's already hard to do it on campus, like at the office, but doing it remotely um, it was like for them, it was like an impossible task. So they really uh, was looking for people who have at least three, five years experience. So where they you know, it's, it became an issue for a lot of my students, right? So I would say in your presentation later, make sure that you convince them, and explain to them how you're going to tackle that remote work, meaning time management. Um, how do you stay motivated on your own? And how do you communicate with uh, your team members remotely? And how do you organize your work to make sure that you meet the deadlines? So if you can explain that, it's going to be way easier for the businesses to, uh, to consider hiring people without experience. Another thing I would say is the presentation video uh, on Bazooka, um, my application, it works a lot. So the most, most of the CVs that are read by employers are the ones who have videos on them, like pitch videos, explaining and then presenting themselves. So I would say even if it's not asked from the employer, maybe send them like a one minute pitch 
of who you are. They like to see the nonverbal and the verbal as well. And it's easier for them to, um, to, uh, to get to know you and then see if they want to call you for an interview, uh, you know, on, on, on uh, remotely. And finally, I would say that most of the market, even more now, more than 80% of the job market is hidden. So just make sure if you're interested in a job to just send the CV right away. You know, don't, don't, don't wait for a job uh, position uh, posting. Just do it if you like it. Create your um, letter of motivation, add your CV, one minute pitch video, and there you go. So, but they, they, a lot of businesses are still hiring, like uh, Mitch said, so do not lose weight, uh, hope. It's gonna be fine. I love it. Basically, make sure you have like an appointment TikTok. That is so, um, I love that. I've never seen that advice before. This one minute pitch video. That is such a cool recommendation. <laughs> uh, Julia, do you have anything uh, for general job seekers that are maybe not the, the, new, the new professionals right now? Yeah, um, I do a bit of career coaching and I always tell people and I'm sure that, you know, people are sick of hearing me saying this, but really leveraging networking and your own network. Um, right now, you know, people are in situations of like privilege where they do have a job and I've seen tons on, on LinkedIn of people who are just like willing to help, willing to review a resume, willing to do an intro. And so I think it's really important now is to, to network with people. Don't just like apply for, for a job online and then, you know, just throw out your resume to hundreds of jobs. I think it's about being really strategic and thinking about, okay, where do you want your next, you know, your next job, next, where do you want your career to go? And if it's within a certain role or within a certain organization, it's reaching out to people within those organizations or those, those jobs or certain fields and really having, you know, that informational interview where you can, you can show your genuine interest and, you know, you just, you stand out um, above the crowd um, right now, there's more people applying for jobs and less jobs, although the jobs are still out there. So you do have to stand out. And I think getting face to face with someone and, and really showing your, your curiosity and your initiative, I think that will, that will, you know, land you an interview a lot quicker than applying for, for tons of jobs where there's, you know, significantly more people applying. So, so definitely leverage your network, reach out to people and, and ask for help. Now is really the time when people are, are willing to help. And, and yeah, so that's, that's my tip. It's so true. You're right. Everyone wants to be able to help in these times. Um, it's interesting as well because the power of networking, it's like I have managed to place interns that um, like either through, through friends or within other departments or other areas because they made the effort of reaching out to me in advance. They kept up the connection. And then when an opportunity came up, instead, instead of like a general look at, let's post this and get 500 interns, it's like, you know what? I actually already have someone perfectly in mind for this. Let me connect you with the hiring manager. Manager. Let's see if this is a good fit. The power of that network is, is absolutely immense. And you're right. I think, I think um, we've alluded to so many times like this hidden job market. Um, some, a lot of jobs don't hit the public sphere. They already have a candidate through their own networks or a referral before they actually need to go publicly and post that position. Sure. Mitch, do you have anything that you can, you would like to add to that? Yeah, no, those are, those are both great tips. And I, I think they, um, you know, I think for me, that's almost like those are the next steps in the process. I almost think you almost have to start with yourself first. And this is the perfect time, I think, to reflect um, and understand truly like what you're passionate about. I love using the, um, the, the hedgehog in good to great. And I know that's applied to businesses in the book, but you can use that on yourself too, right? So, you know, what are you passionate about? What do you believe you have some of the best skills in the world at? And what can you make money at? And if you can find that where all those three things intersect, I think you've been in a great place um, to figure out where you want to go and what you want to do. And then I believe that leads to who you want to network, where you want to network, getting those job applications in there, um, you know, getting, uh, getting your video on Bazooka so you can go get that, get that job. Um, and I think that's, I, I think they're important pieces uh, of the process is really taking that moment or two uh, or even some time uh, chat with people in your network, even that you're, you know, that know you really well and chat with friends and family, understand, you know, what do you think you're strong, strong at, what are your values? And, you know, if you come to talent fit, you can also assess your values on there um, to understand what terms of your work values are. And that'll help you out as you're going in the, 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 the networking process. Um, so I think, yes, be, reflect. And I would say also be patient and don't get frustrated. Uh, it, job seeking is one of the most stressful things uh, that you can go through. Um, so I think you need to know that everybody goes through it. And so it's, it's, um, 
it's tough, but, um, but you know, don't get frustrated and stick to the course and you'll be, you'll be okay. Yeah, I think that's such an important message. Don't get frustrated, don't lose hope. It's, I know it's tough right now. Um, it's, it can be so discouraging and every time you get a rejection letter, you just, another one, you just kind of want to crawl into your bed and never get out of it again sometimes. But, you know, lean on your network for that support, emotional support too. I think, I think it can be hard to ask for help, but this is the time to do it. And like Julia said, like people want to be able to help right now. Let's, let's take a look at some of the questions that have come our way. Um, oh, actually, I'm not sure. Oh, for Sam, many people who are rehired are now requesting fewer hours. How are you suggesting that smaller employees navigate this complete hiring web where some people are coming back with fewer hours and others are now unavailable to work at certain times? I hear a lot of uh, these stories. Businesses are overwhelmed with new requests and a lot of them who were you know, fired for a, a short period of time, now they want to come back, but they have their request and the list is long. <laughs> so, so yeah, so businesses usually what they do because they still need that person because that person worked for maybe two, three years before and have developed um, skills that they need and they, they want to progress with that person. So usually what I see is businesses trying to negotiate and see if they can have two people doing the same, the same position. Um, sometimes they also accept to change the schedules meaning that um, a few hours during the day and then a few hours in it during the evening or even the, during the weekend. So, um, you know, the key is that the businesses need to be flexible. Uh, we've said it since the beginning of this panel. Julia said it, Mitch said it. I mean, um, businesses need to be aligned with um, the values of their staff and, and the culture is going to change for sure. People working remotely, people working in office, people doing both. How are we going to do that? But, you know, I think it's flexibility. Same, same, always the same. Absolutely. This question is from Greg. Have you found that the role of a manager or supervisor is changing with remote workers and other aspects? I don't know who wants to be able to answer that. Sam, do you want to take it? Yeah, I can. And then you follow. Um, I would say the role of manager is changing in terms of um, micromanagement versus macromanagement, micro versus um, macro. Um, I see a lot of manager getting stressed, not knowing what their employees are doing at what time. And I tell them they need to let go. They need to let go and then focus on the end result other than the end of process because they can't control the process from where they are. So, um, so to just uh, trust our employees and make sure that we give them the tools to organize, give them the tools to build their skills, give them the tools to communicate and to be effective working teamwork and stuff like that. That's where the manager needs to focus, to be like more like a mentor re working remotely to their employees than to be a boss. There's, it, it, the concept of bossing someone else is over. It, it should have been over for a long time, but now it's, it's dead. So make sure that as a manager, you are there to serve your employees and make sure that they are in their best shape and they're happy and they're uh, psychologically balanced. That's all you have to do. The tools to make sure that they progress and they're being productive. And then they're going to give it back to you in, in, uh, in exchange, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, it's so true. I think giving them the tools the right way and training them the right way, onboarding them properly, um, and then get trusting in them. And I think a lot of times when you give trust to somebody else, you'll get it back in return and you'll get that loyalty in return too. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be very, very important. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's also just like working really closely with, with HR and understanding what tools can you even leverage? How are you collaborating? Um, you know, providing flexibility in terms of, you know, when and how you're working with your people or when you're scheduling meetings. Um, you know, people have families that are working from, you know, all at home together at the same time. So, you know, is there times when you can provide flex time during your days and then times when you have meeting times? Um, you know, I think those are parts where it's, you know, going back to that listening point we've talked about so much today is, is getting that feedback from your workers 
um, and then being able to plan accordingly so you actually do put a good framework and, and system in place um, and then you can put trust on top of that and I think you're going to be set up for success. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this next question is a spicy one. It says, what are your thoughts on different pay scales for employees performing the same function, but living and working remotely at locations considered to have vastly different costs of living? Um, I mean, I can, I can start and Mitch, you can go ahead after. I think this just alludes to my point before. I think that is quite the norm. And I know a lot of organizations already have that. They do have different pay scales. And so I think that will be tricky as, as um, you know, as we do go remote, you can't, you can't create a pay scale for every city. So it will be probably region wise or maybe province, uh, province wise. But um, I think that is going to be the future and that's just one thing that HR leaders are going to have to have to manage and, and communicate to to also ensure that there isn't any any bias and any questioning from employees so um, yeah those are my that's my two cents go ahead Mitch well I think we're Julia we're on a, a panel with a lot of uh, anal, uh, analytics people watching so maybe we can ask one of them to create that cost of living yeah. uh, scale for us and, and share it with us at some point that could be a, a good solution um, yeah, no, I like. I think one of the pieces I know actually one of our advisors, uh, Talent Fit. Um, he's actually his whole whole you know history of work has all been in compensation, um, and he's actually building a very interesting tool right now um, to look at like pay, um, pay equity across different um, levels of an organization, but also you know factoring in um, you know what it can look like in different cities. Um, so you know I, I think it is tough though, is because um, you know when when people are you know you want to move out of Toronto. So let's say that's, I know that's where I'm living right now. You want to move out of Toronto and move into the country because you want to have more space and maybe lower cost of living. Um, you know, it, it, should you move back into the city to make more money? Do people start faking their addresses uh, or renting places to make more money? Like, you know, I think there's things that there's, there's other things we need to consider um, as this changes. And I know that is, a, it's, it's pretty standard to have people in different cities that are, um, you know, making different amounts of money. Um, I'd say most of the, I'd say often there could even be offices uh, are the reasons why they know that they're going to the office there or whatever it may be too, right? So um, I think we do need to I think we do need to look at the whole picture as we um, you know as we implement things like this. That's so sneaky, Mitch. It actually never occurred to me that somebody would try to uh, try to fake an address. To, it's wow, but it's like I can, it's totally believable, huh? Oh, interesting. Uh, I think this next question, I, I think Mitch, this feels like it's a question for you. An important part of talent management in a company is not on how individuals work, but also how individuals work on a team, interact with each other. How do we maintain a sense of community and how can we have that team magic that are making people work so well together in group work? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm trying to jump in on every question right now here, but I'm um, happy to answer this one. This, this is basically exactly what we do, right, at Talent Pit. Um, we help understand, you know, how work is done in your organization and the, and the work values that you have and, and matching talent to that. Um, some of the cool stuff that we've looked at is actually even um, understanding what the company's culture is based on employee feedback and, and what their values are based on employee feedback, how work is done, how teams function, how leaders function, how people are motivated. Um, then we've actually had their own employees fill out an applicant assessment as well as a bunch of sentiment data around how engaged they're at work, turnover, all those kind of things. When they're actually matched to the organizations, um, we're seeing lots of, they're like their own organizations anonymously, we're seeing lots of great outcomes, things like, you know, 18% happier with their coworkers, 15% half more satisfied with the job, 14% more engaged at work, lower turnover intentions, higher sense of belonging. So to me, the, the magic or the team magic is, uh, I believe Ch Chad put in there, um, I think a lot of that is comes down to belonging and a lot of that even comes down to the, the fundamental values and what the, the true values of the organization is, not what's just written on the wall. Um, and I think that's what um, organizations get wrong sometimes. So um, I, I think it is bringing in people with these aligned values um, and, and align on how work's done, but also at the same time, bringing in people that personalities are different, experiences are different. Um, you know, they're, they're, they come from different backgrounds, um, you know, all those pieces. And that's where you have that build that community um, and that team magic that I think turns into a successful organization. I love those numbers that you said, like 14% more engaged. Like look at all that HR data we could, we could measure. 
<laughs> Such an interesting place. Um, and then I think Chad had an add on here, which is more a comment. I, I think that once we understand that diversity drives business and improves business culture, we will start to go towards a much more inclusive work environment. I agree. Um, I think this is our last question. Do you expect employees who choose or are asked to work in the office to have a career advantage over those that are working remotely? Like how does, how does that impact networking? Um, should we be focusing solely only on digital channels or will classic ways of coffee chats or in-person still have relevance? <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a challenge for HR managers to make sure that people have equal chances of moving forward in the business and grow. Um, for sure, um, it's never going to be the same thing face to face in office work and online. For sure, it's different, different vibe, different culture, different, different everything. But um, it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be treated equally and have the same chances. So I would say it's about the tools that we put in place and activities that we put in place um, online to make sure that even people in the office connect with people outside of the office or at home. For example, meetings. We don't have only meetings for people at the office and meetings separate with people working from home. They're all included and, we, they, and every employee has the ability or the the opportunity to, sh to uh, showcase their talent, their communication skills, and any other soft skills that needed to be able to tackle uh, the ladder of the businesses. So I, I, I don't think that we, um, I, I don't think it's gonna be an issue. I mean, as long as the business recognize that's gonna be a challenge and put all the tools and the strategies in place to make sure that everybody has equal chances, I think that's it. It's a question of priority and recognizing that we, it's, it's going to be a challenge. The one more question that snuck in here. This is, this is the last one because we want to make sure that if people need to take a bio break that we'll have time. Uh, how does belonging change with online lives? I think we all struggled with this at the beginning of the pandemic. People are inherently social. How are we, how are we maintaining or how do you build that community online? Um, yeah, some of the, some of the things I've seen out there is, um, you know, even dedicating things like, um, you know, doing your, uh, employee retreat maybe, which was done usually in person is you now do it all online, but you have like people involved in different sessions that aren't necessarily about professional development. Um, like I've seen organizations do like gardening ones, for instance, and all of a sudden you have people you've never worked with in organizations all together in a gardening meeting together, talking about plants. And all of a sudden you realize that you might have a lot more in common with a lot of people in your organization than you actually ever thought you would because of, you know, maybe you're a senior executive and the junior analyst down there, you've never actually talked to that person before, but also you build these new connections through, through things that you're actually interested in uh, within the, you know, within your personal life. So um, I, I think it does change a lot. Um, I think there, I, I don't think anybody has the answer right now. And I think that's what, um, what, what we're trying to figure out. Uh, but I think there's a lot of very um, interesting ways we can do it. Um, I think also that, you know, as we move past the pandemic um, in the next, my estimate, the next year or so, um, is that, you know, we can actually meet people in person again, right? Like you will be actually able to fly into a place, meet as a team and do those team bonding things. Um, you know, getting through this pandemic may be a little different. Um, and then once again, I would say start with the values. And if you have values alignment, I think people just know how to interact with each other they, they, they'll listen better, they'll um, work with each other better, and they'll, and they'll create better and stronger teams too that, um, that are focused around belonging. That is a, that's that's such a fun technique. Uh, I could really use some uh, gardening help. I have a dead lawn that's full of weeds right now. So if anyone would like to reach out with any tips, I would be fine. I would love to build my network into someone who can help me, <laughs> help me learn. Uh, Julia, Sam, Mitch, thank you so much for your time today. I know I really enjoyed that. Given the engagement from the audience as well, I know that they had a fantastic...